Welcome once again, my friends, and thank you for stopping by to listen to an old storyteller. Today we have a story from Japan, and the title of this story is The Story of the Man Who Did Not Wish to Die. Long, long ago there lived a man called Sentaro. His surname meant millionaire, but although he was not so rich as all that, he was still very far removed from being poor. He had inherited a small fortune from his father and lived on this, spending his time carelessly, without any serious thoughts of work, till he was about thirty-two years of age. One day, without any reason whatsoever, the thought of death and sickness came to him. The idea of falling ill or dying made him very wretched. I should like to live, he said to himself till I am five or six hundred years old at least, free from all sickness. The ordinary span of a man's life is very short. He wondered whether it were possible, by living simply and frugally henceforth, to prolong his life as long as he wished. He knew there were many stories in ancient history of emperors who had lived a thousand years, and there was a princess of Yamato who, it was said, lived to the age of five hundred. This was the latest story of a very long life record. Sentaro had often heard the tale of the Chinese king named Shindo Shiko. He was one of the most able and powerful rulers in Chinese history. He built all the large palaces, and also the famous Great Wall of China. He had everything in the world he could wish for, but in spite of all his happiness, and the luxury and the splendor of his court, the wisdom of his counselors, and the glory of his reign, he was miserable because he knew that one day he must die and leave it all. When Shin no Shiko went to bed at night, when he rose in the morning, as he went through his day, the thought of death was always with him. He could not get away from it. Ah, oh, if only he could find the elixir of life, he would be happy. The emperor at last called a meeting of his courtiers and asked them all if they could not find for him the elixir of life, of which he had so often read and heard. One old courtier, Jofuku by name, said that far away across the seas there was a country called Horizon, and that certain hermits lived there who possessed the secret of the elixir of life. Whoever drank of this wonderful draught lived for ever. The emperor ordered Jofuku to set out for the land of Horizon, to find the hermits, and to bring him back a phial of the magic elixir. He gave Jofuku one of his best junks, fitted it out for him, and loaded it with great quantities of treasures and precious stones for Jofuku to take his presents to the hermits. Jofuku sailed for the land of Horizon, but he never returned to the waiting emperor. But ever since that time, Mount Fuji has been said to be the fabled Horizon, and the home of hermits who had the secret of the elixir, and Jofuku has been worshipped as their patron god. Now Sentaru determined to set out to find the hermits, and, if he could, to become one, so that he might obtain the water of perpetual life. He remembered that as a child he had been told that not only did these hermits live on Mount Fuji, but that they were said to inhabit all the very high peaks. So he left his old home to the care of his relatives, and started out on his quest. He traveled through all the mountainous regions of the land, climbing to the tops of the highest peaks, but never a hermit did he find. At last, after wandering in a region for many days, he met a hunter. Can you tell me, asked Sentaro, where the hermits live who have the elixir of life? No, said the hunter, I can't tell you where such hermits live, but there is a notorious robber living in these parts. It is said that he is chief of a band of two hundred followers. This odd answer irritated Sentaro very much, and he thought how foolish it was to waste more time in looking for the hermits in this way. So he decided to go at once to the shrine of Jofuku, who is worshipped as the patron god of the hermits in the south of Japan. Sentaro reached the shrine and prayed for seven days, entreating Jofuku to show him the way to a hermit who could give him what he wanted so much to find. At midnight of the seventh day, as Sentaro knelt in the temple, the door of the innermost shrine flew open, 
and Jofuku appeared in a luminous cloud, and, calling to Sentaro to come nearer, spoke thus. Your desire is a very selfish one, and cannot be easily granted. You think that you would like to become a hermit so as to find the elixir of life. Do you know how hard a hermit's life is? A hermit is only allowed to eat fruit and berries and the bark of pine trees. A hermit must cut himself off from the world so that his heart may become as pure as gold and free from every earthly desire. Gradually, after following these strict rules, the hermit ceases to feel hunger or cold or heat, and his body becomes so light that he can ride on a crane or a cart and can walk on water without getting his feet wet. You, Centauro, are fond of good living and of every comfort. You are not even like an ordinary man, for you are exceptionally idle and more sensitive to heat and cold than most people. You will never be able to go barefoot or to wear only one thin dress in the winter time. Do you think you will ever have the patience or the endurance to live a hermit's life? In answer to your prayer, however, I will help you in another way. I will send you to the country of perpetual life, where death never comes, where the people live forever. Saying this, Jofuku put into Sentara's hand a little crane made of paper, telling him to sit on its back and it would carry him there. Sentara obeyed wonderingly. The crane grew large enough for him to ride on it with comfort. It then spread its wings, rose high in the air, and flew away over the mountains right out to sea. Sentara was at first quite frightened, but by degrees he grew accustomed to the swift flight through the air. On and on they went for thousands of miles. The bird never stopped for rest or food, but as it was a paper bird it doubtless did not require any nourishment, and, strange to say, neither did Centauro. After several days they reached an island. The crane flew some distance inland, and then alighted. As soon as Centauro got down from the bird's back, the crane folded up of its own accord and flew into his pocket. Now Sitara began to look about him wonderingly, curious to see what the country of perpetual life was like. He walked first round about the country and then through the town. Everything was, of course, quite strange and different from his own land, but both the land and the people seemed prosperous, so he decided it would be good for him to stay there and took up lodgings at one of the hotels. The proprietor was a kind man, and when Centaro told him that he was a stranger and had come to live there, he promised to arrange everything that was necessary with the governor of the city concerning Centaro's sojourn there. He even found a house for his guest, and in this way Centaro obtained his great wish and became a resident in the country of perpetual life. Within the memory of all the islanders, no man had ever died there, and sickness was a thing unknown. Priests had come over from India and China and told them of a beautiful country called Paradise, where happiness and bliss and contentment filled all men's hearts, but its gates could only be reached by dying. This tradition was handed down for ages, from generation to generation, but no one knew exactly what death was, except that it led to Paradise. Quite unlike Centauro and other ordinary people, instead of having a great dread of death, they all, both rich and poor, longed for it as something good and desirable. They were all tired of their long, long lives, and longed to go to the happy land of contentment called Paradise, of which the priests had told them centuries ago. All this Sentaro soon found out by talking to the islanders. He found himself, according to his ideas, in the land of topsy-turvydom. Everything was upside down. He had wished to escape from dying. He had come to the land of perpetual life with great relief and joy, only to find that the inhabitants themselves, doomed never to die, would consider it bliss to find death. What he had hitherto considered poison, these people ate as good food, and all the things to which he had been accustomed as food they rejected. Whenever any merchants from other countries arrived, the rich people rushed to them eager to buy poisons. These they swallowed eagerly, hoping for death to come so that they might go to paradise. 
But what were deadly poisons in other lands were without effect in this strange place, and people who swallowed them with the hope of dying only found that in a short time they felt better in health instead of worse. Vainly they tried to imagine what death could be like. The wealthy would have given all their money and all their goods, if they could but shorten their lives to two or three hundred years even. Without any change to live on forever, seemed to this people wearisome and sad. In the chemist's shops there was a drug which was in constant demand, because, after using it for a hundred years, it was supposed to turn the hair slightly gray and to bring about disorders of the stomach. Centaur was astonished to find that the poisonous globefish was served up in restaurants as a delectable dish, and hawkers in the streets were about selling sauces made of Spanish flies. He never saw anyone ill after eating these horrible things, nor did he ever see anyone with as much as a cold. Centaro was delighted. He said to himself that he would never grow tired of living, and that he considered it profane to wish for death. He was the only happy man on the island. For his part, he wished to live thousands of years and to enjoy life. He set himself up in business, and for the present never even dreamed of going back to his native land. As years went by, however, things did not go as smoothly as at first. He had heavy losses in business, and several times some affairs went wrong with his neighbors. This caused him great annoyance. Time passed like the flight of an arrow for him, for he was busy from morning till night. Three hundred years went by in this monotonous way, and then at last he began to grow tired of life in this country and he longed to see his own land and his old home. However long he lived here, life would always be the game. So was it not foolish and wearisome to stay on here forever? Sotaro, in his wish to escape from the country of perpetual life, recollected Jofuku, who had helped him before when he was wishing to escape from death, and he prayed to the saint to bring him back to his own land again. No sooner did he pray than the paper crane popped out of his pocket. Centaro was amazed to see that it had remained undamaged after all these years. Once more the bird grew and grew till it was large enough for him to mount it. As he did so, the bird spread its wings and flew swiftly out across the sea in the direction of Japan. Such was the willfulness of the man's nature that he looked back and regretted all he had left behind. He tried to stop the bird in vain. The crane held on its way for thousands of miles across the ocean. Then a storm came on, and the wonderful paper crane got damp, crumpled up, and fell into the sea. Centaro fell with it. Very much frightened at the thought of being drowned, he cried out loudly to Jofuku to save him. He looked round, but there was no ship in sight. He swallowed a quantity of sea water, which only increased his miserable plight. While he was thus struggling to keep himself afloat, he saw a monstrous shark swimming towards him. As it came nearer, it opened its huge mouth ready to devour him. Centaro was all but paralyzed with fear now that he felt his end so near, and screamed out as loudly as ever he could to Jofuku to come and rescue him. Lo and behold, Centaro was awakened by his own screams, to find that during his long prayer he had fallen asleep before the shrine, and that all his extraordinary and frightful adventures had been only a wild dream. He was in a cold perspiration with fright, and utterly bewildered. Suddenly a bright light came towards him, and in the light stood a messenger. The messenger held a book in his hand, and spoke to Centaro. I am sent to you by Jofuku, who, in answer to your prayer, has permitted you in a dream to see the land of perpetual life, but you grew weary of living there and begged to be allowed to return to your native land so that you might die. Jofuku, so that he might try you, allowed you to drop into the sea, and then sent a shark to swallow you up. Your desire for death was not real, for even at that moment you cried out loudly and shouted for help. It is also vain for you to wish to become a hermit, or to find the elixir of life. These things are not for such as you. Your life is not austere enough. It is best for you to go back to your parental home, 
and to live a good and industrious life. Never neglect to keep the anniversaries of your ancestors, and make it your duty to provide for your children's future. Thus will you live to a good old age and be happy, but give up the vain desire to escape death, for no man can do that, and by this time you have surely found out that even when selfish desires are granted, they do not bring happiness. In this book I give you, there are many precepts good for you to know. If you study them, you will be guided in the way I have pointed out to you. The angel disappeared as soon as he had finished speaking, and Sentara took the lesson to heart. With the book in his hand, he returned to his old home, and giving up all his old vain wishes, tried to live a good and useful life, and to observe the lessons taught him in the book, and he and his house prospered henceforth. Thank you once again for listening to this story. If you enjoyed this story, please press that like button. Also, please help an old storyteller out by subscribing to my channel. The next story will be posted in a few days, so until then, may your story continue to be a good one.